for everyone's sake, it's probably better if I actually have my notes. <laughs> I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Gosh, it's so wonderful to be here. I think this morning was my prettiest drive so far in the state of New Jersey. The trees were just exquisite. The roads were just wonderful. Even with the rain, it was, it was pretty much a perfect morning, so wonderful. And this incredible setting, just a block and a half, I think, from the beach. What a special place. It's wonderful to be here with you, not just because of the beauty of creation that surrounds us, but also because of the nature of this service. We get to gather together for the UTO in gathering and also the installation of our diocesan Episcopal Church women officers. I'm grateful for the good work that is done through both of those ministries and for the ways that the ECW keeps women's ministries active and engaged and doing good not only in our congregations but across the diocese and even in the national church. I'm also grateful for the ways that the UTO um, offering is supported here, and especially for the work that you have done to enable that, uh, that, that wonderful gift that empowers people to do ministry and engage in God's work in the world in ways they couldn't have done without it. This work matters for many reasons. It matters to our local congregations. It matters to our diocese. It matters to our church. And it matters to the people around, the people outside the church who may not know what we do in here every Sunday, but who are the recipients and benefit from the gifts that you all give and share. So today, is that better? Excellent. Today is a day to celebrate God's work through your ministries and in each of our lives. And yet that gospel, hmm. It was a challenging one, wasn't it? Doesn't quite seem like celebration. Listen again to several of the phrases from Jesus himself. Everyone who denies me before others will be denied. How about whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven? They're difficult words. And there's been much speculation about that sin, that blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. In some form or another, this, these comments exist in, from the comments from Jesus exist in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in all three Gospels. That doesn't always happen with our scriptures. Sometimes we find that there's a passage that's only in one or two, but in all three of the synoptic Gospels, the Matthew, Mark, and Luke, that's see together and line up together. If we find a passage that is repeated in all three of them in some form, then scholars tell us it's absolutely highly likely that Jesus actually said it. And so we can't get away with explaining that maybe a very grumpy editor in the second century added in a few words, right? I struggle with this passage a little. I have to tell you, and I suspect I'm not the only one here. I want to tell you, though, about a conversation I had with a priest this week. Uh, we were talking about spiritual practices and what resonates with us and, and the things that we have done throughout our lives where God has been present and fed us in particular ways. And one of the things we came to talk about was the practice of pilgrimage. I was really in many ways formed by pilgrimage because when I was a very young person, I had just finished my, my Master's of Divinity degree and I had been ordained a deacon. And I was able to go to Jerusalem to study and live and work in the holy city for a year. It was a tremendous gift. I worked for St. George's College, and I was able to be with pilgrims and students from around the Anglican Communion to visit different sites and see different parts of the Holy Land. And the Holy Land, of course, has been much on my mind and my heart this past 10 days or so with the devastating, destructive, violent, situation that is happening there. And so I ask your prayers for peace there, for support for all of those who have been wounded, um, and just ask that you hold that up as part of one of the places where we see the brokenness of this world. 
But one of the interesting things about the sites in the Holy Land is that they have been places of Christian pilgrimage since the days of the resurrection. There's evidence of Christian pilgrims. There's graffiti in Jerusalem that dates back to the year 70. Isn't that astonishing? It's graffiti that Christians wrote on the wall saying, Lord, we have arrived, as a sign that they were actually in the place of the resurrection. And part of the reason for that is that in the early church and in the ancient world, people felt and believed that the stones themselves could see and had memories and bore witness to. So if you were standing in the place where the crucifixion had happened, then the very stones themselves were witnesses to that crucifixion and resurrection. And you could witness with them and through them and participate in a different way in the story of God's redemption. I wonder if this might help us just a little bit to understand why our loving and forgiving Jesus might name something as unforgivable. Now that sounds like a bit of a stretch, doesn't it? Stones that witness to the unforgivable sin. I wonder, though, if there is something about the ways that difficult things are carried into the world that places in the world a memory of that brokenness and that pain, right? In a way that is carried forward. It's easy for us to forget sometimes what has happened before. But God doesn't. And our world doesn't. And our world carries the marks of those difficult and painful places even when our own eyes have not seen them and our own hearts have forgotten them. Denying before others repeatedly and publicly leaves that mark of rejection on the world. That is true hardness of heart, that permanent turning away from the truth of God. I think, my friends, that that is what the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit actually is. It's not about those moments when we stumble. It's not about those places when we get angry and say or do things that we should not. It's not even about those whole sections of our lives that we'd rather forget about. They're part of who we are and we carry them with us, yes, and they're part of the world, but they are not in the same as that true blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which I think is that permanent and long walk away from the bright light of God's truth. That's that hardness of heart against others and the desire throughout it all to choose the self over the greater goodness of God. Because, my friends, if those stones in Jerusalem that bore witness to the rejection of Jesus, his trial, his crucifixion, and his death still stand and carry that memory, they carry another memory as well, right? And that is, of course, the memory of the resurrection. Even that story is redeemed. Even that most difficult situation, the loss, the death, the grief, the passion of our Lord, is redeemed, and the stones themselves bear witness to it. It's really only in those long walks away where there is no possibility of turning back. There is no story of redemption there. And my friends, I am absolutely certain that that is not the case for any one of us in our earthly lives, right? I actually don't think it's possible for people of faith whose hearts are set towards responsiveness to God and God's people to actually even begin to commit that long sin against the Holy Spirit, that denial of Christ himself. Because with all those moments where we may fall short, we also return yet again to the loving arms of Jesus himself. And yet we see so much brokenness, so much hardness of heart, and so much division in our world, don't we? Friends, this is where the work that you do as faithful people of God, as members of the Episcopal Church, women or supporters for those folks in this room, the gentlemen here who are not members of the ECW, as people who do good and give generously to support the, the United Thank offering, those are those places where ministries enable hardness of heart to be overcome. That's the way, one of the ways 
that the church is able to be present with people in their brokenness and call them back again to the good news of the resurrection, to the good news of new life, to the good news of hope-filled communities where ministries take place that feed the hungry, that clothe the people who don't have clothing on our, in our communities, you know, the homeless in winter with coats, the ministries that provide shelter for those who have no homes of their own. That kind of work is where the light of God shines through the work of our hands and our communities in a way that redeems even the most difficult, despairing walk away from God. So those stones that cry out, cry out in witness to the goodness and the possibilities and the hope that comes when communities gather in mission and ministry. Is it easy to be a person centered on God's hope in today's world? I think most of the time that's a difficult thing, don't you? The news stories over the past not weeks, but months. But our gospel doesn't end with condemnation. Even today, the gospel reading ends with a promise that God will be with us, and God will teach us, and God will give us the words that we need. And the gospel for all time ends not with the crucifixion and death, but with the good news, the call to share and spread and proclaim. Remember the last words of Matthew 28? Go therefore into all the world and baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Again, do not worry about what you are to say, for the Holy Spirit will be with you and God will guide you. As a kid, I grew up in an unchurched home. And I, I actually, the church we weren't going to was the Anglican Church of Canada, but we very definitely were not going. <laughs> and I remember being really curious about what Christians did on Sundays and at other times. And for a while, we lived in a place where the, the commute involved a bridge every morning, and my parents, my mom would drive my brother and I to school across this little bridge, and the traffic always stopped. And about once every couple of weeks, we wound up behind this car that had a bumper sticker on it that I found fascinating. It was words that are attributed to St. Francis, although whether or not he said them, who knows. But the words were, you may be the only gospel your neighbor ever reads. I know this is true. I know this is where those difficult gospel stories that remind us of the hard places in life also invite us into being people of good news who share not the difficult stopping points along the way, but the end of the journey, and that end is life and love, right? Your work as the ECW, as people who participate in the United Thank Offering, as members of churches here in the Diocese of New Jersey and, and in the communities around here, your work may be the only gospel our neighbors ever read. Thank you for this, and may God bless you and strengthen you and sustain you. Amen. <laughs>